Lord, bless the study this morning. We pray for an outpouring of your spirit, your guidance, your wisdom, uh, your implementation of the things that we learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're in uh, Genesis chapter 46 and, um, or 45, actually. We'll, we'll start with uh, 45 and... Um, the, the, the things that have happened with Joseph, uh, he's on one side of the fence, if you will, uh, he, and his family on the other. The irony is his family put him on the other side of the fence. Uh, his brothers threw him down a well. They meant to kill him, and then they said, well, don't kill him. Let's take him out of there. Let's sell him. So they sold him into slavery. It was his brothers, not his father, of course, his father uh, was uh, grieved over uh, the loss of his son. They lied to him. They said that, well, he uh, was taken by an animal and tore him apart, and they showed him his coat of many colors, and uh, it had blood all over it because they dipped it in the blood of an animal that they killed. And, and, and so as far as he was concerned now, Joseph is dead. And he is grieving over that. And in verse, um, uh, well, let's take it back from 44, just as a quick overview of this. In verse 18, Judah came near to him and said, My Lord, let your servant speak a word of my, in my Lord's hearing, and do not let your anger burn against your servant, for you are even like Pharaoh. And what's happening now is, Judah is interceding for Benjamin because Benjamin is in the custody of Joseph, who is now second only to Pharaoh in the land. They don't know that it's Joseph yet, and that's the key element of all of this. But there's a famine in the land, and so now they're destitute, they're without, and they're trying to figure out what to do, and so they go to Egypt. And uh, Egypt, they meet Joseph, who they don't recognize, and, of course, why would they at that point? He's the leader of the country. And uh, they think he's, you know, he's sold into slavery. What good could come from that? And um, he says, listen, um, you're going to have to bring your younger brother here because he doesn't believe them because, obviously, they're, they've attempted to murder him. They lied to their father. Not really a trustworthy group, and we talked about that before. Um, so verse 19, my, my, uh, my Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? They're talking to Joseph. And we said to my Lord, We have a father and an old man and a, a child of his old age who is young and his brother is dead. And so now he's, they're telling some of the truth. And he alone has left his, mother, his mother's children and his father loves him, speaking of Benjamin. So he says, then you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. And this is the point now to bring the brother. And this is where we ended up last week. So, uh, And we said to my Lord, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. But you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall, not, you shall see my face no more. So it was that when we went up to your servant, my father, that we, were told, we told him the words of my Lord, and our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But we said, we cannot go down if our youngest brother is, uh, is with us, unless he's with us, for then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me, and I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. So now Joseph knows what they said to him, right? But if you take this one also from me, and the calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now therefore... When I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant. 
our father with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. And we went over that part last week. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? Least perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. In other words, probably have a heart attack and die right on the spot. So then we pick it up from there. Uh, and this is really a, 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 an interesting story because none of it um, seems practical in the sense of how it works. It'd be like, you know, you got a bunch of barrels in a warehouse and you're moving them around and everything else and then Somebody says, well, how do you make it, now that we've done this, how do you make an empty barrel, what can you put in an empty barrel to make it lighter? What can you put in an empty barrel to make it lighter? Well, holes. <laughs> well, you wouldn't think of this <laughs> because God puts holes in their story, in their life, actually to accomplish a purpose. It, it, you just wouldn't look at this and say, I know how to save everybody seven years from now when there's a famine and put Joseph in prison, put Joseph's life in jeopardy, and then at the last minute, literally, raise him up to be next to Pharaoh, to where he has authority over all the grain in the land. And so when they come because of starvation, the very brother they killed or tried to kill, sold into slavery, is the one that's going to redeem them. It is uh, a really a picture of Christ, of course, in the allegory. Well, then Joseph could not restrain himself, in chapter 45, verse 1, before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out for me. So no one stood with him, and while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Why do you think he made them all go out? Was it just because of the tears and the stuff? It's a good possibility because he's never told Pharaoh or anybody else, what they did to him. He never said anything to them about his brother selling him into slavery. He got into prison because of Potiphar's wife. But it doesn't appear that he ever said a word about the events that happened to him from his family. And so in some ways, he actually protected and guarded his family. Because once he was raised up to be next to Pharaoh, and you saw what Pharaoh did to... He's got the, the baker and he's got the cup holder. And uh, one of them, as you know, didn't do well. And Pharaoh didn't put him back in prison. He killed him. What would he do to a family that would throw this wise young man into prison or into a, into a, a pit and try to kill him? What do you think Pharaoh would have done thinking he's doing Joseph a favor? So there's some things that's just better not said. Uh, because it gives people a preconceived notion or idea about somebody and, and maybe their life has already changed. And so he wept aloud, the Egyptians the, uh, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh, they heard that. Well, then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Now, the word dismayed is a little understated, I think, because in the Hebrew... It, it means literally to tremble, to tremble inwardly. Imagine the one, the brother who you turned your back on. You've thrown him down a well. You intended to kill him. You sold him into slavery. He's standing before you and he says, hey, I'm your brother. <laughs> I mean, they were, their knees were knocking is another way. That, you know, they were trembling inside. Why would they tremble? Because... They think, I believe this is the case, because you see it all happen too often. They think that he's going to do to them what they would have done to him if the roles were reversed. That it's a kind of a paranoia that's born out of somebody's own personal uh, direction in life. And so many times, and you see this happen in politics and everything else, 
that one group gets accused of something that it's because they're the ones that are doing it, <laughs> the first group. And it happens in individual lives. And they're scared that he's going to do to them what they would have done. In fact, take a look at what happens. Go to uh, Genesis chapter 50. Jacob's dead, and now it's just the brothers, no covering from the father, and Joseph, the head of Egypt, next to the Pharaoh only. And so in verse 15, it says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. Instead of thinking good of him because of all that he's already done, he's fed them, he's housed them, he's clothed them, he's given them the land of Goshen. He's, he's, uh, he's blessed them in every way possible, right? <laughs> but they think, well, probably maybe because of dad. So, because that's the way they were. They're putting on him their own characteristics. So they sent me uh, messengers to Joseph saying, hey, before your, your father died, he commanded saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your, fa your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants uh, of the, the God of your father. Um, and Joseph wept when they spoke to him. I think he, this is just, you know, I read too much into it, but I, I, they lied again. There's nowhere in the scripture that his father said this to them. Um, and the problem is, even after they've experienced redemption, you know, uh, in, in a book called The Green Letters, he points out, he said, sin is in you, but it is no longer on you. When you're saved, sin is no longer on you. Uh, you are delivered from its power, but it's still in you. And if you give it place, it has influence. Uh, deliverance comes when you reckon the old nature dead, Romans 6, 6. And when, you, when, when things come your way, that you, you stand against it in the name of the Lord. Uh, but it's still there, and so they go back to their old ways, and they lie to him. And I think this is part of why Joseph wept. However, he says, his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, behold, we are your servants. So now they're showing some humility. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? And this is really key. Because vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God has ordained that governments have a place of authority in people's lives. Uh, you know the old saying, you do the crime, you do the time. And uh, if someone uh, kills somebody in your family, it's up to the... Uh, uh, government in all lands to take care of business, have that person arrested, make, you know, is, did, why was it done, what happened, either the death penalty or life, whatever the country says, but it's not for you to do that. It's called, in the Old Testament, they had uh, cities of refuge, so if somebody even accidentally killed somebody, they could run to a city of refuge and stay there, be like they were in that place then for the rest of their life, they're in jail. But if they left there, then the relative could go kill him. <laughs> so it was, a, it, was, it was a safety zone, but there was judgment for it. And so he's saying, who am I to take God's place for vengeance? That's between you and the Lord, in other words. And I've seen this happen in the body here where some people have experienced everything from drive-by shootings to drownings and other things that were on purpose to some of their family members and be able to say, I forgive those people or that person, but they deserve justice, and I'll leave that up to the Lord. And you know what, then they stop becoming a victim. The, the family member starts becoming a victim of the crime or the incident, and they can say with great authority, you know, that, that person is gonna face God, not me, because I've forgiven him, but Will I testify against them? Oh, absolutely. Justice needs to be served. But they no longer hold that, that grief in their heart of feeling like they're the ones that have to get even with them. Because that puts us in the place of God. That, that is only God's determination. 
Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. In other words, it doesn't negate the truth. <laughs> He's saying, you know, do it. am I going to forgive you? Absolutely. But you know what you did was wrong. You do know that, don't you? <laughs> in other words, and we'll find in the prophecies concerning them in the end of the book, if you read through those, God brings judgment into their lives. But God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and for your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And the word kindly means he spoke to their hearts. In other words, he didn't speak to their minds. He spoke to their hearts about his relationship, I think, to the Lord, his relationship in the family and all that. He spoke to their hearts, their emotions about what's going on and, and what he was doing and why he was doing it and all of that and brought comfort, great comfort to them. There's a lot to be learned from Joseph in the relationship of being a type of Christ, uh, for one thing, but also uh, just his human example to us. So let's go back to chapter 45. In verse 3, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence, his trembling. And Joseph said to his brothers, please, come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother. And I think this is what opened their eyes to realize he wasn't, he wasn't a liar. <laughs> Whom you sold into Egypt. And I don't think anybody but them knew it. And the people that bought him and then sold him to Potiphar. Um, he says, but now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. In other words, don't let this be allowed to be a constant condemnation in your life. Did you mess up? You notice in the last part in chapter 50, yes, you messed up. However, God has used this for a purpose. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Now, it appears to me that half of them, we know one of them, Reuben, didn't want anything to happen. We know, uh, it appears to me that half of them, and I'll show you why in a minute, uh, were probably arguing. We know Joseph said, when you leave, don't argue. So they were arguing about all things all the time. And so as a group, he says, look at God worked all of this out. It was going to happen. Could have happened by one brother or all ten. So I think there was choices involved. But he says, for, but God has used this. God sent me to preserve life. And he was going to get him there one way or the other, I think, is the issue. Um, for these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there, are, and there will be five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity or a remnant, in other words, for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Have you ever had something happen in your life when you just uh, were devastated by it and then years later you look back and think, you know, that's made me a better person. And I wouldn't have chose it, but God did and it certainly worked together for good because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. I can see God's plan in this. I saw an interview with uh, a guy, oh, I can't think of his name now, he was a movie star, was a, uh, uh, anyway, he's been a, he's an alcoholic, he, he calls himself a recovering alcoholic for the last 26 years, and uh, he's, he publicly spoke about being an alcoholic and all of that, and, and um, uh, in, in, in doing so, he said something, he said, you know, I'm glad that I'm an alcoholic. And the interviewer said, you're what? He said, I am because I know my nature. I know who I am. And if I didn't have this in my life, the things I've learned over a process of the last 26 years is, has made me a better person. He's, I'm, I'm, I'm much closer to God. I'm much closer to people. I understand things I could have never understood before. That's the first time I've actually heard an alcoholic say, you know, this had a positive influence on my life. Of course, he's on the other side. He's not drinking, he hasn't for 26 years. So he's sober enough to understand it. But in the victory understanding, there was a purpose for it. So now it was 
not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Then let's go to chapter 46 as we find he gathers up the family and he's getting ready to bring him down. Uh, he tells, he reminds the brothers in verse 24, don't argue uh, when you go to get my father and all of this. And then we get to 46 in uh, verse 1. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and he came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. Then God spoke to Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob, and he said, here, here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. What's happening here is he was told by his son, who he thought was dead, who is now alive, look at, come, come to Egypt, I'll take care of you. And so he makes plans because obviously he wants to see his son. But you know, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, who's he getting this information from? The brothers. Just real humanity. I mean, it's like, should he trust them? But he's going because they've got the evidence of the carriages from Egypt and, and all the blessings. But it's like, you know, you have to wonder. And then God speaks to him personally and says, no, it's okay. Go, don't be afraid. There's something about this, and, and he goes to a place that he was familiar with to, to, to pray and to get some answers. That when something is happening in your life and you're thinking, oh, if I could just get a solution, somebody brings a solution to you. And you go, wow, that's just, you know, that'd be too wonderful to believe. Could this be the Lord? And get the confirmation from God to know, don't be afraid, it's okay. This is something God is doing. Somebody says, look at this is, this is just made for you. you know, yes, it is. I got to go pray. <laughs> because you should get confirmation. You should have a sense of peace from God. If you don't, then just because somebody else said it doesn't make it, you know, the Lord. Hey, God told me you're supposed to be my wife. <laughs> I'm going to talk to God about that, you know, right? God told me you're supposed to be my partner. Sounds great. I've been looking for that. But let me, let me pray. <laughs> Is, is God confirming it? Find out from the Lord. And that's what we have here is the confirmation. So he went to worship. He went to pray. God speaks to him and says, it's okay. Sounds weird, but go to Egypt. <laughs> and uh, verse 27, same chapter. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two persons, and all the persons of the house of Jacob who went to Egypt then were 70. They come out with over a, over a million. Some think as many as two. Uh, but they go there with uh, 70 people, and uh, God is going to bless them and give them an inheritance in the land. So, and of course, that took years, obviously, but they go there with just 70, small beginnings, big results. In verse um, 28, then, then he sent Judah before him to Joseph to point out before him the way to Goshen. Now, when something's repeated, it's usually, it's not usually, it is for a reason. And, uh, and they came to the land of Goshen. So Joseph made ready his uh, chariot and went up to where? To Goshen to meet his father, um, Israel. Now, to go to the land Goshen, Goshen, Goshen. Because now as they do archeological finds and they say, well, we don't know if they were in the, uh, this place or that place and we're not sure. The Bible says, without any doubt, they were in the land of Goshen. Goshen, you know, it keeps repeating it. So I looked it up, and I found out in the archaeological finds that the land of uh, Goshen, the Shun, the last part, is, 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 a, uh, is, is actually called that land. It's called the land of Shashu of Yahweh, literally, or Yahweh in the land of Shashu, which is the land of Goshen, has been found in Egyptian inscriptions dating to the 18th and 19th dynasties, or 15th to 13th centuries BC. And the earliest reference to Yahweh out is the earliest reference to Yahweh outside of the Old Testament. The Spios Ar Artemidos inscription in the 18th dynasty uh, reign of Hatshepsut mentions Leviathan shepherds in the Nile Delta, which is Goshen. 
in uh, Genesis chapter 46, where the sons of Israel were the shepherds in the land. I just point that out because over and over again, God has given very definite things in the Bible so that if there was any question about it, even if you haven't dug it up yet, if you keep digging, you'll find it. <laughs> and they found that with the name of Pontius Pilate. Pilate never existed. Now they've got you know records of him as existing and street corner signs and everything else that they've dug up. But those things are repeated for a reason for the archaeologists, I think, as much as anybody else to keep looking. Anyway, is, uh, so Israel said to Joseph, now let me die since I have seen your face because you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and those of my father's house who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds for their occupation has been to feed livestock. This is what he, he says, I'm, I'm going to tell Pharaoh. And they have brought their flocks and herds and all that they have. So it shall be when Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation that you shall say? Well, what's their occupation? Shepherds, right? Why would he have to tell them to say that they're shepherds? I think the answer is in the next part. You shall say, your servant's occupation has been with livestock from our youth, even till now, both we and also our fathers, that you may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. Now they know that. I think he's telling them, I know that. Shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. But don't you dare lie and say you're anything but it. <laughs> right? Because they're liars. And, he, he, you know, don't try to impress him and say, well, we know how to do carpentry and we've done this and we've done that and we built and we like He says, look at your shepherds. You better say your shepherds because I'm going to get you in the best land of Egypt in Goshen. So don't lie. So he tells him, you better you say this. Well, then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, my father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. Indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. Um, and he took five men from among his brothers. Notice he only took half of them. I mean, I think all of this is in the Bible for a reason because remember he said stop arguing when he sent them back. I think he took the ones that would listen to him, would say the truth, wouldn't change it, and wouldn't argue about it. <laughs> and sometimes you have to pick and choose. You know, sometimes you just do. And... Um, so he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And they, they, all of them, in other words, the five, said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, both we and our fathers. They said exactly what they were supposed to say. And they said to Pharaoh, we have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks and for their, the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now, therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen then uh, Pharaoh spoke to the jo Josh, uh, Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. They didn't come to me. They come to you, but you represent this authority. He says, So, the land of Egypt is before you. In other words, you, I told you you could do whatever you want. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. I think he's recognizing the courtesy that and respect Joseph has shown. He's saying, I can put them where I want, but where do you want to put them? And he's saying, you know you're an authority. You've got the power. Go ahead, put them in Goshen. But kind of a tip of the hat of respect of saying, well, you're doing it the right way. <laughs> There's just something, that'll be, something to be learned from this when it comes to business relationships and everything else. And if you know any competent men among them, then uh, make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. And Joseph uh, brought in his father, Jacob, set him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. I think that tells you something about Pharaoh and um, a spiritual side to him, that he would yield to Jacob to bless him as an elder, as a statesman for Yahweh, uh, and um, just that sense of spirituality and, and uh, as an elder in that sense too. Uh, that, that just says something about humility, I think, in that, because there was nobody more powerful than him but I think you'll find that um, uh, 
he has a really strong spiritual nature, and we'll look at that in a second. But I remember I've told the story before, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Joe Gottwald that I worked for. And as the owner of the company, a, a multimillionaire, uh, influential in, in Los Angeles politics and everything else, and, and at the time, he's with the Lord now. But uh, uh, he called me one day. I'd worked for him for about uh, maybe four or five months. He hired me knowing I was born again and, and everything else. And he was a, a Lutheran man who didn't quite understand anointing with oil and all that stuff. And he says, but I, I, I want what God wants. Anyway, he said, hey, I'm really sick. I got a meeting with the mayor. I've got this and that going. I can't afford to miss it. But he said, I got a fever. I just, I, I'm really not doing well. Would you pray for me? Now, I, I worked for him for a couple of months. Our status in life is completely about as far afield as you could possibly get. And uh, I thought, wow, of course I will. And I was going to get up and leave because I thought, that's, you know, I got to get to work and I'll pray for him. He got up, left this huge desk, came around to the other side, got on one knee and bowed his head. And I thought, wow, that was a symbol to me of humility I'd never really seen before. And I anointed him with oil and I prayed for him. I went to work. Uh, about three hours later, two hours later, he called me and he says, boy, praise God. And he didn't say praise God. He said, thank you very much. And I said, what was the Lord? What's going on? <laughs> and he says, I went to the meeting, got in the car, just on the way I was totally healed. Come, no fever, no nothing. I said, oh, <laughs> good, I'm still working there. Uh, but w I think this is the kind of thing with Pharaoh. That's what I see in my mind anyway. So uh, they, they're, they're getting ready to, uh, to deal with the famine. Joseph's dealing with the famine in the land, and this is what happens with the Egyptians. He's buying up all the land. He's buying up everything because um, they're coming for food. So he's giving them the food in exchange. He's getting the land because that, it's that bad. And in verse 20, Joseph then bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh for every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's. And so the people, he moved them in, then into the cities uh, from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other. So he brought them all into the cities, but he took the land. Only the land of the priests, notice, he did not buy. For the priests had uh, rations allotted to them by Pharaoh. And they ate their rations, which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their lands. So then Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have uh, bought you and, you and your land for this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh, four-fifths you shall keep for yourself." Um, and then in verse 26, Joseph made it a law in the land to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except for the land of the priests, uh, only which did not become Pharaoh's uh, property, in other words. And the biblical thinking of the United States when it was founded comes from this kind of attitude. So that there, uh, we, we pay taxes on this property for housing taxes, you know, for, what do you call, uh, for schools and all those kind of taxes, but not the general property tax. It's exempt. And it comes back to this. And I think one of the many reasons why the United States is blessed is because of the obedience to the scriptures when it comes to these things. And it shows you Pharaoh's heart, I think, too, in all of this. Um, but for the economy, here's an interesting thing. There are those that want a socialist com economy. And what that basically is, is everybody works for the government, and then they kind of say everybody gets the same pay except them. Of course, they, like you saw in Russia when the gates were, the walls were down there, the people that run the government were very wealthy. And same thing in China and other places like that. But here's a system that happens. Everybody goes broke. The government takes everything, but then they say, you keep... 80% and we'll just have 20%. Well, that's cheaper than the taxes we play, <laughs> pay. The only difference is they're saying, okay, we've, we've done all this stuff. Uh, it, it belongs to the government. But instead of saying you work for the government, say, no, the government's are, the property's ours, but you get 80% of it and Pharaoh gets 20. So it's, it's kind of an interesting philosophy in the sense of government. I don't know of any, any place that's ever done it, and I'm not... But it, it allows the, the balance for them to be capitalists 
because they could make the most out of their land, out of the land, and keep, keep it, unlike communism, which they don't, they work hard, they get the same as if they don't work at all. So anyway, it's an interesting thing of how that developed. Now, then you get to chapter 48 and 49, and uh, Jacob pronounces blessings on all the tribes and, all, and, and curses, too, that are there because of things. Uh, but in every curse is a blessing because there's the outcome of the Lord. And I'll let you go through that yourself. But I thought, how does this apply to us? When you are seated in heavenly places in Ephesians because you're born again and you're a co-heir with Jesus Christ, and that's the scripture reference in Ephesians on the front of your cover, and you're a, you, you, you belong to the Lord, you've got rewards, in Matthew chapter 6, it says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, God's going to take care of everything else for you. In Romans chapter 8, it says, well, I'll just let you read it through for yourself. But when you read Romans chapter 8, you read Romans chapter 12, there's no condemnation that are the, to those that are in Christ Jesus, and there is no weapon formed against you that can prosper. And all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to purpose. And there is not height, nor depth, nor principality, nor power. There is nothing formed against you that's going to prosper. Well, Jada said, uh, we were asking about devils. I said, well, devils are about as bad as they get. A devil is the worst evil, terrible thing because there was something they talked about a murder on the news and she caught it. Why do the people do that? And I said, well, the devil gets into people and does, can the devil get into me? I said, absolutely not. You have Jesus in your heart and you bring Jesus into your heart and the devil, you know, can lie to you and do a lot of things, but he can't take you. He, he, you belong to the Lord. And um, she looked at me for a while and she's, she kind of goes, <sighs> feels good. You know why? Because it's true. And God wants you to be confident of your life no matter what's happening, no matter what's taking place, because we get to be like the brothers of Joseph sometimes, and we quibble and quarrel and fight over really stupid things. And the Lord says, look at the inheritance I've given you. You're a co-heir with Jesus Christ. We worry about so much that's going on in the, in the world around us. Do we have to deal with it? Absolutely. Joseph dealt with it. He says, yeah, you guys, you did this, you did that. But God meant it for good. And so he was standing on the promises of God instead of their quarreling. He wasn't foolish about the issues of life, but he stood on the promises of God. And when we stand on those promises, whatever else is forming and clouds that are taking place, you know, the issues of life, when you step back and say, God, I belong to you, your will be done. Isn't it interesting that, that he says, this is the prayer that you should pray. In other words, pray like this. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah, give me this day my daily bread. I got to eat. And in Psalms 23, and you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Even if you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, you're to fear no evil. Those are promises from God. Colossians chapter 1, Ephesians, Romans chapter 11 and 12, uh, chapter 8, on and on and on. As you read through the promises of God and you read the comfort of God, and he's a lamp to your feet and a light to your path, as you trust the word of God, it will cover every other issue in life and bless you. But if you listen to the world, the devil, and the flesh, you're going to get defeated. And the biggest battle, I think, that we fight, on, honestly, is not the devil. It's not even the world. It's what's in what J.D. calls the jellyfish area. <laughs> uh, he's our, our brain is like a jellyfish sometimes. <laughs> I don't know where she got that. But she, <laughs> you know, it just kind of swims around every once in a while. It stings you, I guess. But where our brain tells us, oh, they're going to do this or that. It's paranoia coming from our own sin life. And so therefore we, okay, I'm going to prevent it from happening. And the person's going, why are you doing this? Because we think it's something, they're going to do something bad to us, so we do it first. <laughs> Sometimes we are our own worst enemies is the point. But if we go back and stand on the promises of God, we stand in the victory of Christ. We are crucified with Christ. Yet not I, but Christ who lives within me. We've been raised again. 
and as we act upon the word of God, the authority of God. And if you're one of those people, and this happens to all of us periodically, where you go, oh, I don't know if I can believe that. But you believe what's on Facebook. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your guidance and wisdom in our lives. And, and there are things that happen that, yes, it, it, terrible, horrendous, and yet you work it together for good when we're seeking you first, when we love you, when we trust in you, you take some very terrible things in our lives and you make them into something beautiful. You give, me, you give us the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You give us beauty for ashes. Thank you, Lord. Just like Hawaii, a, an island built on ashes, and it's one of the most beautiful islands in the world. And our lives are like that, Lord. We thank you for your promises, your blessings, your purpose, and your plans. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.